Good. I know that it's a bit late. After lunch is not always a good time to attend a talk. So thanks for coming. Please take a seat yourself. Uh, my name is Eduardo Silva. I'm a software engineer at this company, which is called uh, Treasure Data. And as the company name said, we care a lot about data. We have a, a SaaS platform, so you can ingest your data, your marketing data, or whatever, and you can get some insights from your data. But when you have some kind of platform to manage data, there is one missing step. You can, you can have a platform, but what really gives you the value is the data. And that's why we got into this world of logging like four years ago, creating some data tools in an open source way to collect data from your own services or your own applications. So, and this talk is about how to get started with logging in Kubernetes. Uh, our company is one of the sponsors also of the projects FluentD and FluentBet. Uh, would you please raise your hand who's using FluentD right now? Okay, this is my crowd. Thanks. So, as I said, uh, I'm an open software developer at Treasure Data. Uh, I'm part of a FluentD open source team, but my primary role is also maintain and develop uh, this little project which is called FluentBet, that maybe you are hearing a lot about it in the last year. So, let's talk about applications and logging. When you have a, some kind of application, the old way to perform logging is just to write some message to some special place. And sometimes this is the hard disk or a log file. And that for, that, for us, is called logging. If you are over 30 years old, you realize that you play a lot with syslog, file system, log files. If you are in your 20s, maybe you're looking, oh, what is that? You're using journal D or something more fancy right now, right? Okay, but logging uh, happens in different ways, not just to the file system. When you have a Unix process running in your environment, actually you have like three main channels of communications. The first one is a standard input on which can be used to uh, send messages to the application. When you're using your terminal in OS X, Mac OS, or Linux, and you type some command and put a pipe, what you're doing is just redirecting the output of one program to the input of the other. And piping happens because of this streaming interface. But when we talk about logging in general, and specifically in the container world, we are talking about this. There we go. We have some luck here. Battery. There you go. I'm going to stay on this side. So, and the login happens specifically on the standard output and on the standard error interface. And if you're dealing with containers, you realize that this sounds a little bit familiar. So, login and in Docker containers. I assume that oh, most of you, not most of you, but half of you are using FluentD. But who's using Docker at the moment? In sub level. Okay, 80%. Cool. So, and Docker has also its own strategy to perform logging. Now, first of all, uh, I understand that you know what a container is, right? A container is not Docker. Docker is just a wrapper, a tool that allows to create this concept of container. A container is a process running in a containerized space, which is restricted by the Linux kernel, meaning that you have some namespace and C groups, which allows to say to this application, you only have access to the file system, or maybe not. You have access to a network, or maybe this amount of CPU time. But dealing with those kind of system calls, or using the command line with LXC, takes some time. And that's why Docker allows you to provide a full interface on top of that and manage containers. And also, it cares about logging. So if one application sent a message like, hey, Kubecom, actually what will happen is that Docker will say, OK, I got a message. But that message is not like a standalone message like in the old log file, because we have some kind of context. 
And this context means from which kind of stream this information is coming from, for example, the standard output, and at what time this information was created. And that is really, really relevant. And if you look carefully, uh, I don't know, have you looked at the log files of Docker? Uh, OK, yeah, nobody do it. You don't want to do it, right? Because it's like a path, a lot of hash and things, and nobody cares about that. You don't need to. It's a waste of time, unless you are trying to create some logging solution. So uh, my goal here is try to explain a little bit how logging works behind the scenes, because if you understand that, you can optimize in the higher level. Okay, so when you get, a, for example, a, a message in your application, Docker, what we'll do is create a JSON map, assuming that you're using the JSON driver, this journal D driver and others, but we're basing on JSON, and it's going to store this in the file system where the Docker engine is running. And basically, it will use bar leave Docker container slash the Docker ID hash Every, every unique identification for the container is stored in the file system, and then it appends the final log file. So from an operational uh, perspective, this is good, because uh, if you want to manage logs for Docker, you have to discover the log files. You have to read each container log file to realize what kind of messages the application in the container is generating. Also, I don't know if you look carefully in the previous slide, but the message is stored in one key, which is called log. Right? The log key is an important one, because that is the one that contains the message. And of course, you want to append some kind of metadata. So let's try to look very quickly about how this works locally. So um, if I'm not wrong, I'm going to use my commands here, so we don't waste time with typos. I learned that in the past conference. So basically, we are going to run a Docker container with BusyBox and just print out the message. But I'm running with a daemon flag, which means that runs behind the scenes, but also will give me the container ID. That is the one that I want to use later to gather the logs in the file system. Of course, you can use the docker logs command, but here we are doing the manual stuff. OK. This is the container ID, the container hash. Okay. Of course, you're not going to remember that. But what I want to do is to dig into my file system and see where this exists. I'm going to become sudo bar lib docker containers. Oh, we have a batch of containers. So, uh, is that fine or too small? OK, thanks. You're still young. I'm not. <laughs> so, if you, if you do a query here in the, in the path, you will see that the container has many information associated with it, like the context, if it mounted some volume, and so on. But here, we just care about one piece, which is the log file. If I cut the log file, I will find my message. Here it is. It's a JSON message in the file system. Now we can do this like with JQ. It's more beautiful. OK, that's it. Your application triggered a message. It goes outside through some streaming interface and then it traps by the Docker engine. Docker engine creates a new log file, and this log file can be seen by everybody or the Docker tools that does exactly the same that I'm doing right now. OK, I wanted to show you that because you need to understand that before to move forward. So I present. So applications in Kubernetes. A quick overview. Who's running Kubernetes right now? OK, so I got an idea. OK, pretty quickly, I'm going to see the concepts. You have one application. In Docker, you have one application runs in a container, and that's fine. But here we have a few additions. For example, an application runs in a container. But for Kubernetes, a container is not like an object or a concept. What 
Kubernetes is about, knows about it, is the pod. And the pod is a concept which allows you to group different containers. So, for example, if you have a web server and you have some uh, database, you can run both in the same pod because it belongs to the same context. That's an example. You can run it on that way or not. Okay? But, but you can have many uh, containers running in the same pod. Usually you have one, but you can have many. But a node, a node I mean a host, a physical machine or a virtual machine, can have many pods. That means multiple applications. And you know that Kubernetes cluster has many nodes. So the thing is, how do you deal with logging when you have a cluster? When, for example, you deploy your application, your application got some repli replicas in different nodes. How do you gather the logging? How do you centralize the logs? Because Kubernetes is really good for this. It has a scheduling. You can create your own applications, self-healing, all that things. But for logging, we have new challenges. It's not enough to go to the file system, as I did right now, and query each log file. Because 10 years ago, if you have some issue in some application, you used to SSH into each server or use some kind of remote syslog to do some troubleshooting. But here, the things change. It's a game changing. And I would say that is for good. For who manage logging, of course, we need to do more work. Actually, I'm sure that nobody here finds that logging is fun, because it's not. Logging is not fun. But if you are here, it's because you have to deal with it. Right? And we had to fix it. So, a logging context in Kubernetes. In Docker, we used to have like the pipe, right? Standard output, maybe, the log message, and we have uh, the timestamp. But if you're running in Kubernetes, there's some extra information. For example, the pod name, which pod this belongs to, the pod ID. Because maybe you can have the same pod name, but restarted like 10 times, and the pod ID will be different. The namespace that it belongs to, the node, the labels, and annotation. Do you know what are the labels? No. OK. Imagine that you have uh, several applications, and you have different environments. For example, you have production, you have testing, and development. How do you make some differentiation between them? OK, I, I create namespaces. Cool, you can create namespace and group the pods associated with development on that namespace or in production or testing, whatever. But if you want to query the API server in Kubernetes to say, please show me all databases from the three environments, you use labels. Means that when you create the pods, you attach some kind of label to the pod. You say, and this is uh, the new application version 4. Please show me all the information that you have about application 4. And you can add many labels as you want. Because labels allows you to do some selection over the resources inside Kubernetes. And labels are, uh, are also the key and annotations to do a better login. So if we think about the log processor, we need, we need to think about, we have the logs, that is the message, but we need to understand what is the context of that message. Because it belongs to a container name, or to a pod, to a namespace, hold, labels, and annotation. If we cannot get the context, the information is irrelevant. So, from a log processor perspective, I'm talking about in a general way, it doesn't matter the log processor that you are running, it had to deal with this. It's going to get the container name, container ID for the file system or journal D. But if you want to correlate all, all this information with the Kubernetes context, you need to query the API server. When you have a Kubernetes cluster, you have an API server, or, which is called a master. And the master knows about, well, through ATCD, knows all the states of the pods or all the nodes. So if I'm running a pod in node B, the API server knows what are the labels and annotations associated with this pod running on that node. So at some point, you need to take the whole information and merge it. So here is what the log processor uh, needs to do the hard work. 
Okay? This is not too straightforward from the beginning unless you have the right tools. And that's why we have a open source and kind of certified tools for logging. So it's like this. If you are doing logging, it's because you want to do some data analysis. But in order to perform data analysis, you want to centralize your information. Otherwise, you cannot do it. Okay? And the whole deal of log processing and logging in Kubernetes in general is that you need to take the information from multiple sources, unify this information in a central place, like a database. It doesn't matter the database. Could be like a streaming database like Kafka, could be Redis, MySQL, Elasticsearch, or whatever. But the important pieces here is the log processor. Because if the log processor is not able to correlate information between the pods, between the nodes, in between with the labels, you cannot get the right insights. So log processing in Kubernetes. This is how it works, basically. Do you know what is a daemon set? OK, everybody knows what is a pod? Yeah, I just say that, right? A pod is a container which is running in a node. A daemon set is a special pod which runs on every node of your cluster. If you're going to deploy your application and you said, OK, this is a pod, no, it's not a pod. It's going to be a daemon set. Automatically, Kubernetes is going to have at least one replica of that specific application pod on every node of the cluster. And if you add a new node into the cluster, when you start up and bootstrap everything, it's going to start a new pod. Because with a pod with a specific daemon set. So if we want to solve logging in Kubernetes, we want that our log processor runs on every node of your cluster. Because if you imagine that you have just one, uh, OK, one node, one virtual machine. And that virtual machine has many pods. All the logs from those pods are in the file system on in journal D, on that specific environment. The API server doesn't know anything about logging. OK? So what you need to have is to have the log processor running locally in the node. Of course, this log processor, as a daemon set, needs to have special permissions to read the log files from the file system. Uh, read this. It said bar log containers. OK? But that is only symbolic links to the Docker engine that I just showed you before. So what we do is basically deploy uh, the log processor as a daemon set, and then we start reading the logs, because we're going to read each container log file. And that is expensive by nature. It doesn't matter if it is file system or journal D, it will be expensive anyways, expensive in terms of computing. And then we need to go with the second steps, which is gather the metadata, labels, annotations from the API server because we want to merge this information. OK, let's do a simple um, example about how this works. OK, uh, here I'm running Minikube. Are you familiar with Minikube? Yeah, yeah most of you. If it doesn't, a Minikube is like a single instance of Kubernetes that runs in a virtual machine that you can run in your own computer. But make sure to close Slack and all other things, Elasticsearch. Yeah, that's why when, when I'm start, I'm starting the demo, I had to look at the, the memory available because I had to start Minikube, Elasticsearch, Kibana, and that's it. OK? So Minikube is running. I'm going to look at the, uh, the pods that are running on this uh, specific stuff. There's nothing in the default namespace. Let's make sure that we have, OK, everything is fine, right? This is my own single stuff. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to deploy a pod, an application. And this application is just a a fake simulator of Apache Web Server. So what it does is just to write a simple log file, so simulate Apache log files to the standard output randomly, okay? Every one, every second. Okay, this is the base image. If you have your computer, you can run it. Oh, let's run it here. Docker run ti. 
I'm going to run it locally outside of Kubernetes, just using the Docker container. There you go. It just prints one message, random message with IP address and messages, one per second. OK, I'm going to deploy the same thing, but in my Kubernetes single cluster. OK, so kubectl, create, pod patch in that demo. So kubectl, get pods, watch. Oh, it's already running. So let's use now the, the Kubernetes uh, login tool to see the logs from that specific pod. So it will be kubectl, logs, Apache logs, and follow the logs. There you go. So the pod is running. But right now, those logs are just in the file system of Minikube. And we can dig into that. If you do Minikube SSH, just for demo purposes, bar leave containers, uh, leave containers, uh, thank you. Ah, oh, here are the containers. This is our friend. But that friend of us has more information. In the Docker context, we used to have just a hash, the container ID. But here we have the namespace, we have the name of the pod in the same f name of the file. Right? And if we create that file, we do a cat, you get the JSON message, for example, this one. OK? That's fine. Until now, there's nothing fancy. OK, I'm going to exit from Minikube. OK, kubectl, get pods. Apache Logs is running. But what I wanted to do now is to install my, login, my log processor as a daemon set, run locally, take out the logs, process the logs, and ingest these logs into a database. For demo purposes, I'm going to use Elasticsearch. And we will see if that is working, because I reduced the memory usage right now. So OK, it's still alive. Cool. And just for sanity purpose, we are going to wipe the database. Don't do this at home or in production. This is the magic key. Oh, there you go. So if we do, for example, we're using cool like the HTTP client to query the database to see if we have some records. Uh, cut indices. Pretty. Oh, there's nothing. We have nothing. Cool. It's empty. So the next step is to deploy the daemon set. Of course, if you want to install a log processor, you just need to get the right documentation, the right commands. Uh, for example, I'm going to show the namespaces and have created before a namespace which is called login. So I deploy my daemon set and namespace which is called login just for some, having something looking good. Okay? There's no relevant thing here. And I'm going to deploy a Fluent Bit, Fluent Bit, which is a log, a log processor. I'm going to talk more about it later. So we're going to deploy is a config map. Do you know what a config map is? Uh, yes, OK. When you have a container running and you want to ingest configuration, you have two ways. Or you create your own container, and when you create the container, put the log file inside the container, but if you want to change the configuration, you have to rebuild it. Or you can pass the configuration files as mounted volumes. So when the, the container starts, it can see the files as a volume that was mounted. Okay? And a config map is an object in Kubernetes that allows you to ingest configuration inside the pod. So this is not something that you need to understand uh, or remember by in your mind, but this is the configuration for fluentbit.conf. This is the input from where I'm going to collect the logs. Right now, I'm going to process only the Apache logs. I'm going to use the parser for Docker. I'm going to filter the data. What a, a filter does on this case, go to the API server, gather the labels, metadata annotations, and merge that. And then 
I'm going to ship this information, because this is the output, to Elasticsearch. We use ES for short, but it's Elasticsearch. And we are using the magic IP in Minikube. With that IP, you can talk directly to the, to the native host. OK? So I'm going to ingest the configuration. Uh, bit, config map. OK, ready? And I'm going to deploy Fluent Bit, the daemon set for Minikube. This is the Docker image for Fluent Bit that I'm, I'm pushing right now. That version was released this Monday, so it's like the new version. So, kubectl create ds minikube. There you go. So, kubectl get pods. OK, Fluent Bit is running. OK? So, what that means? Oh. I'm going to query the Elasticsearch database. Well, let me do it some silence here. Can you see this number? That's the num number of records that the database has. So from one side, I'm running Fluent Bit as the log processor inside the node. And from the other, I'm querying the database. And I'm seeing that the logs are hidden there. OK. Let's try to do some visualization. Localhost, here we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Discover logs. And we're going to create the timestamp thing, choose that. We need to choose the right things, otherwise we don't get the logs. And here, here are the logs. For example, I'm going to choose this one, this entry, and I'm going to the JSON that was ingested into the database. If you look carefully, here we have the stream, the timestamp, and we have this new addition of information. And that information comes from the API server. So when you have centralized all your logs in your database, now you can query the information. You can say, please show me all the logs that the pod name belongs to Apache. And you're going to get everything about Apache. OK? So that was a quick interview, so a review about that. So I know that most of you are using, the, are using FluentD. And FluentD is more than just a strong logging solution. Actually, FluentD is a, is a fluent ecosystem. And FluentD, I don't know if you're aware about, but FluentD joined the CNCF. It's an inception project, incubation project, sorry. And we are in the process to, uh, for graduation, maybe in a couple of months or before the next KubeCon. But FluentD also has like, a huge community. We have like 700 plugins available for storage in Kafka, Elasticsearch, uh, MySQL, Redis, and, and so on, and different filters. And uh, when we donated this, also uh, there's a strong commitment from the company to continue growing FluentD in all aspects, even the community. For example, if you're writing your own applications in Python language, you can use the Python SDK for FluentD, and you can ingest your login messages directly to FluentD. But in order to think, make things better, because sometimes people complain that FluentD can't use too much memory in some scenarios, we started creating a new solution, an alternative solution, which is called FluentBit. And FluentBit is like a C language version of FluentD, but uh, with a strong focus on Kubernetes and Docker containers. And FluentBit 0.13 was released just this week. And one of the features is annotated pods. I don't know if you remember when you look at the Elasticsearch stuff. For example, we don't have too much time, but we'll try to do it very quickly. For example, the Apache log here, where is log? You know, that is a row string. But in your mind, you know that the Apache log has an IP, a timestamp, an HTTP method, and a status. So one of the new features of FluentBet for these cases is that we implemented annotated pods. So when you deploy your pod, you can say, OK, this is my pod. 
But also, please, Fluent Bit Processor, use the Apache parser. You can suggest that from an operational perspective. So let's do it pretty quickly. If you look at this spot, there's a new annotation. This one was not there before. We are suggesting the, the log processor that you can use this specific parser. It's the same uh, container, but with a different uh, level, so annotation. OK. So that is running. We got more hits here. And we're going to Kibana, and we're going to do some search. So Kubernetes at pod name equals Apache logs annotated. OK, here are the new logs for the specific pod. And now there's a difference. Can you see this? That was not there before, because Apache logs doesn't have a structure. But suggesting a parser to the log processor, you can get that right away inside your database. Before this, you had to do a lot of magic in order to make it happen. And now Fluentbit can do it for you. That is one of the biggest things. And another feature, I'm not going to demo because it is pretty much the same, that you can do, for example, uh, you can say, please exclude my logs. You, as a pod, you say an annotation, fluentbit.io slash exclude true. Please ex exclude my logs. Because there are some times that the posts are too noisy, are running in debug mode, and you don't need that. Uh, we added metrics for JSON and Prometheus. So that means that you can query also how your logging solution is working internally. And I think that this is uh, one of the most expected features. Um, since we have a few minutes, I'm going to run it locally in my computer. I'm not going to run Prometheus right now. Fluent bit. <laughs> Here it is. So I'm going to run Fluent bit locally in my computer. I'm going to use the input. Uh, Fluent bit can read many things log files, TCP messages, but also CPU metrics. CPU metrics and send the metrics to the standard output every second. Ah, but I didn't start the web server, so I cannot get the metrics. There you go. OK, it's writing the metrics, taking some, getting some metrics, and pushing those metrics to the standard output. Now, we can use the HTTP interface to query the internals of the web server. OK, uh, in a beauty way. There you go. So you can get also some insights from the version that is running, 0.13, community edition, the build flags. But what is more important, the metrics that we have. So in the input, we have one input CPU. We are processing 37 records, which belongs to 11,000 bytes, and so on. So if you refresh this information, you will see how it grows. And what you do specifically is that let Prometheus consume this endpoint. But you know, oh, this is JSON, but Prometheus has a different format. Slash Prometheus. There you go. OK. Thank you. <laughs> Looks like you, you love Prometheus, right? <laughs> yeah. No, it's really cool. So yeah. So this is one of our additions. And also, people say, from the enterprise, we need more enterprise connectors. We solve all the data collection for Kubernetes. But now we can in, want to ingest the data in other places. So we added support for Azure, for Kafka, and also Splunk. Maybe you love it, maybe you hate it, but we have the support for it because people want it. OK? And well, annotated pods, you can use the power set to suggest a power set. And I say suggest because in the Fluent Bit configuration, you can reject that rules. Maybe some guy wants to deploy a pod which wants to exclude their logs, but if that flag is not uh, enabled or allowed in Fluent Bit, it will not happen. It will log it anyways. Annotated pods, we just see that, how we can put an annotation. Uh, well, Fluent Bit built in metrics with Prometheus, and that's what we show you right now. Uh, well, 
I, I don't think that we have time for the last uh, demo, but we're going to run pretty quickly in one minute the stats of a project. We have so far in less than three years, we had like 74 releases, more than 32 contributors. This is slow, but we can grow with you guys. Uh, every day we have more than 50,000 downloads every day since the last month. And that means that we are getting more than three millions of dollars in the, in the last year. And what means 50,000 dollars? 50,000 nodes that are created every day somewhere that needs a login solution are choosing FluentBet. And these same metrics apply for FluentD. So people use FluentD and FluentBet in different scenarios. This is how it's growing. Somebody here was testing it, but he didn't like it. <laughs> Happened that uh, in the last version, 0.13, we were doing all these tests about HTTP metrics, and we did uh, like uh, 20 versions since January, once a week. And people were testing, testing, and people were so excited that some of them said, hey, I deployed this in production. Shit. And what happens at the end, sometimes we have some crashes, some bugs, and they say, oh, but it was running this in production. Don't do it. It's a test version. But now we are really good. It's pretty stable. We don't release something buggy. We have unit tests. We are going forward now with the CI CD and all that things. So uh, we just started the next version, CIOTAT 14, the development. We started just after KubeCon all right now. So our goal is to add load balancing for multiple outputs. Maybe if you are sending to one Elasticsearch, you can have many at failover, run robin, uh, support nested multi-line in Docker JSON logs, for example, Java stack traces. And we need help with documentation, unit testing, with everything that relates to an open source project, so you can reach us anytime. So thank you so much. <laughs>